Hello, good evening. So I make my students, my PhD students do this every semester, and I'm always the one who fails every time. I can never keep the three minutes, but I'll try. <laughs> very, very hard. So I do research uh, on why and why not people use science to make decisions. That's the big umbrella. And I have been doing this for a long time, and I started on a climate-related issue. I tried to understand how farmers in less developed countries were actually using ENSO, which is El Nino forecast, to make decisions about crops. And from that research, I started to you know, get this bigger and bigger umbrella about all kinds of, of uh, information, but mostly climate change. So to give you an idea of how I think about this, and this is uh, some work that I have done with uh, two students, Christine Kirchhoff and V.J. Abram Parasite. The idea is that we know that there is a lot of research out there. There is a lot of science out there. We also know that people are making a lot of decisions every day, decisions that affect our lives, sometimes very dramatically. We also know that a lot of those decisions that people who are affecting our lives are making are not being informed by science. And so there is a disconnect between all this knowledge that we are producing and people making decisions, and especially in uh, uh, climate change in general. So one idea was to try to understand why, why this disconnect exists. Uh, we go every day to our offices and we try to produce something that is useful. I have talked about this several times and some of you might have heard that, but I don't know every, anybody who goes to their office and say, I'm going to produce a piece of completely useless information today. <laughs> we always think that what we do is useful because we want to do good. We want our knowledge to affect other people's lives. On the other hand, when you go and you talk with decision makers and other kinds of uh, uh, officials or government or tribes, we figure out that they are on the other side saying, nothing that you produce is useful to me. So we make a theoretical, the, a theoretical distinction between what's useful, which is what we are putting out there, what we are producing, and what's usable, which is what decision makers actually know and use. And our, the problem is where we make this disconnection or that little uh, green uh, point over there in which uh, knowledge is meeting its need. And this is an amplification of that uh, little green point. And then we systematically went looking at the mechanisms and of the techniques that people were using, processes, to make those two things meet. So the most obvious one is interaction. When you talk with decision makers, they'll tell you what you, they need. You try to match what you're doing with what they need. That process, the meaningful interaction between producers and users of knowledge, is known as co-production. It also has other definitions, but mostly it's about interaction, iteration and interaction. So co-production is what we know empirically is the most effective method to bring those two things together. And then there are other things that you can do. You can uh, you know, visually communicate better what you do. You cannot use jargon. You can try to be uh, much more um, uh, cognizant of the decision-making process so that your new knowledge does not conflict with knowledge that people are already using. But co-production really is the one that has cap captured a lot of attention and a lot of effort. So you want to go from useful to usable, but the <coughs> ultimate goal is really to have knowledge used. And if you look here, and I'm not going to go through all of those things, this is what's in the literature, empirically and normatively, that affects this move from knowledge from use, uh, useful to used. So you have things like, uh, you know, Les talked about and other people talked about. It's about uh, the understanding each other. It's about, you know, temporal disconnection. It's about having the, exactly the piece of information. Uh, all of us who have dealt with stakeholders we know that when we ask stakeholders what they want, they want to understand what's going to happen exactly, where they are to make the decision that they want at the time that they need. And we know that that's a very tall order, especially for climate information. Drew was talking about his relationship with the water manager. Uh, you know, we know what they need because they tell us, but many times we cannot meet that need because of uncertainty, skill, and other things that the models are not good enough for them to make decisions. So in my other life, I'm co-director 
of Giza, which is a center at the university funded by NOAA, whose mission is to increase the use of climate information for adaptation in the Great Lakes region. So I do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, as my day-to-day -day business, I have one of the climatologists of, uh, of Giza here. So Giza are a bunch of knowledge brokers, from the social science to the climate science. And we are trying to understand how to supply that. One of the models that we use uh, is this boundary chain model. What the model means is that one of the biggest impediments for interaction for co-production is trust. Everybody will tell you it takes a long time to build trust. It's also logistically impossible to talk to everybody, to interact with everybody all the time at a drop of a hat. So logistically, co-production is very costly for the participants. How do you decrease those costs, those transaction costs? So this idea of uh, the linkage chain or, or the boundary chain, any boundary chain, is that you link organizations with each other with different vocations. And in this chain, each one plays a role. And this role is facilitating knowledge movement each time. So climate scientists is in CLASP, which Rick Root is a cool PI on, 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 on DESA. And Drew has collaborated with us on some of the climate science that we have produced. Gliese is the broker in the middle that talks with the stakeholders, understand what they need, makes that bridge, sometimes communicate in a different way, customizes information for different users. And then we fund, we give organizations very little money, like 20K a year, for them to actually be brokers for us to the information users. One of our most uh, successful boundary chains is with cities in the Great Lakes. And the project actually started in the project that I had with Liz Gerber, funded uh, by Kresge Foundation in the beginning. Today, we work with over 15 cities in the Great Lakes in a very close relationship using this model. Another way is through networks. So this is a network study that we did in Gliese in which we looked how information diffused from the NCA in 2000. I have this joke that I say, for the old crowd will understand me, being in a network study is like the Hotel California. It's very easy to get in and then you never leave. <laughs> and that is a very good example. You started asking questions from three people. All of a sudden, you have a network of hundreds of people. And, but that's a very good uh, picture of what 20 years of knowledge uh, dissemination means. And in the end, we actually had to interview people at the borders to understand how they were using that knowledge. And we find out that it's mostly through communities of practice. People will trust people that they trust. And there, that is a way to do that. A lot of part of this work is trying to understand how knowledge builds capacity to make decisions. This is work that I do in Northeast Brazil. So I went back to my early work on understanding how farmers use ENSO. This is work that I did with Holly Eakin and Don Nelson. And we came up with this theoretical, with this heuristic, to try to understand how capacity is combined. So is capacity for adaptation about money, education, safety, which we call generic capacities, which is basically development? Or is it about real specific things that you can do that are about climate change? So we compared cross time households that were under a program in Northeast Brazil that increased their, uh, their, their wealth, their income dramatically in 20 years to try to understand which were the most important factors. Was it about money and education and health? Or was it about, you know, um, irrigation and uh, you know, alert systems and drought uh, programs. So this is 600 households across uh, 14 years. And what we found out is that although people are much better off development-wise, a drought can completely wipe out 15 years of progress. So it is really about those two things together. It's about assets and it's about risk management. So how do those things for me come together? Do I try to understand the role of knowledge in building adaptive capacity? And through Gliese in cities in the Great Lakes region, in water management everywhere, and in rural communities in Northeast Brazil. 
I teach, so you saw all the methods that I have used across those. I've been doing something now, I'm obsessed with the scaling up, how we scaling up, we scale up co-production. And I have been doing now some experimental work for now only with students at the University of Michigan, but I'm trying to really do more with real decision makers to try to understand how we can still do co-production without having to talk to everybody all the time. And I teach the PhD class, and I teach another class, Adaptation and Development, FBITE. Thank you. <laughs>